internet, welcome to Game Theory, where today it's all about taking a breath and looking back. In this day and age of internet discourse, everything has to be hyper-relevant all the time. You need that hot take right now. You need your review ready minutes after seeing the movie or playing the game. Search trends rise and fall faster than ever before. And if you're not ready for it, well then too bad, my friend. The internet's moved past you and you've been left in the dust. You ain't getting those views, you ain't getting those clicks, and your pocketbook is gonna suffer because of it. And I don't know about you, but for me at least, it takes time to come to a well-informed opinion. Sometimes you just need a few minutes to stop and gather your thoughts. I mean, don't get me wrong, there is definite value in first impressions, reacting authentically in the moment, but those first impressions are always going to lend themselves to being more emotional, more extreme. Everything suddenly feels like it's either the best or worst thing in the moment, but if you give it an hour, a day, a Week, suddenly you're able to get a better sense of perspective. A world that is always so focused on the here and the now and the immediate is a scary world because you never have a chance to look back and learn from where you've come from or to truly appreciate just how far you've grown, how far you've come. And especially when you're talking about big picture stuff like life decisions or massive industry trends, well, those are made up of complicated webs of interconnected events, like a ball of bunched up Christmas lights that require time and patience untangled. Anyway, that's my long-winded way of saying today's episode is all about untangling that ball. Reflecting for a minute as we cross over into the 2020s, because guess what? We are at the end of a decade, guys. I mean, that is a huge deal. And yes, I know a handful of you in the comments are going to be smart butts about it and say there was no year zero, Matt Pat, so technically the decade ends next year. And yes, you're right. I respect your push for factual accuracy. In fact, I wish more of the world cared about the facts to the level of diligence that you do. But you know what? At least for today in this silly little video that I'm putting together, I and the rest of humanity are going to ignore that because we're flawed creatures, just small microscopic ants on a volcano mechanic spinning ball in the middle of a massive vacuum, chaotically careening through the galaxy. And in our limited experience full of billions of variables, we cling to the arbitrary marking of time because a simple digit taking up, rolling over in its ceaseless march forward gives us comfort, a fleeting sense of control, a solid place in the endless existence of time. TLDR, we like seeing the numbers flip over to zero. It's easy to overlook just how long 10 years of time is, but but at the start of this decade, people still cared about the Jersey Shore for some reason. They still thought the world was going to end in 2012. Disney had just bought Marvel and was just starting to figure out what to do with the surprising success of a little movie called Iron Man. Star Wars? Forget about it. It was a completely dormant franchise still two years away from being picked up by Mickey's little mouse fingers. On YouTube, it was the heyday of the virus. Viral video as Double Rainbow and Bed Intruder song were some of the most popular on the platform, where videos were still short enough that you could actually watch them on the toilet without causing loved ones to think you had an intestinal problem. And in the world of gaming, well, we were nearing the end of the Wii era, but motion controls were still the order of the day with the connect and move just starting to hit store shelves. Farmville was crushing it over on Facebook, Angry Birds was crushing it over on Mobile, and both of them were paving the way of casual social gaming. And little did we know it, but we were standing on the brink of an indie gaming revolution with the release of titles like Super Meat Boy, Limbo, and Braid. And with that little bit of retrospective context out of the way, what I want to explore now is this. What were the most important games of this last decade? Notice that I didn't say the best. I'm sure your feeds are going to be filled with best of the year and best of the decade lists if they haven't been already. Honestly, my list of personal favorites from the last 10 years would look a lot different from the list of games that we're covering today. It would include things like Witcher 3, Dark Souls, Mass Effect 2, Doki Doki Literature Club, and Beat Saber, all for very different reasons. But what I want to answer today is, if we look at where we started in 2010, and now where we ended up as we cross into 2020, which game 
games shaped the world of gaming, or heck, the world beyond just gaming. Which ones had the greatest impact on this medium by maybe or maybe not being good games, but instead by reinventing the industry as we knew it? And when I went back and did the research, two games seemed to really stand out for me in this decade. But before we get to those, let's first speed run our way through the rest of this decade and through some quick honorable mentions that really exemplified the last 10 years in gaming. Let's start our honorable mention list where the last decade left off. Like I said, by 2009, casual games were all the rage. We are nearing the end of the Wii's life cycle, an era of gaming defined by easy to pick up and play experiences. Suddenly my grandma, who'd never picked up a controller in her life, was dunking on me and Wii bowling. At the time, casual gaming had started to seep into every phone, every tablet, and every- No! No, I will not join your effing farm! I will burn them to ash before I bother to click on your rutabagas. Long story short, the definitions for both game and gamers had suddenly gotten a lot broader in ways that truly skilled, lifelong players didn't really appreciate. There needed to be some differentiator, something that separated the hardcores from the casuals. Enter our first honorable mention, Dark Souls. Dark Souls, whether we realized it at the time or not, was gaming's collective response to the social and motion control trends from the previous decade. At a time when gaming was increasingly becoming a series of gimmicks, Dark Souls emerged as a truly gamer's game. It became a rite of passage to prove your gamer cred with its mottos of get good and you will die, taking the idea of old school difficult and modernizing it for a new generation. Dark Souls showed the gaming industry that there was still an audience who wanted to be challenged, who wanted a high skill ceiling. In the same way that Doom basically created the FPS genre, and our concept of what a fighting game looks like was shaped by Street Fighter 2, Dark Souls had given rise to an entirely new genre of game. Couple that with a beautifully intricate world design and implicit storytelling, and you have yourself something revolutionary. When every other moderately difficult game is suddenly labeled a Souls-like, whether a appropriately or not, you know that you've pioneered something special. But that's not to say that casual gaming was completely out of the picture. In fact, there was one game that did the impossible, got us gamers out into the sunshine for some exercise. Oh, and it also managed to unite both the hardcore and casual gamer audience. And that game was Pokemon Go. For one blissful summer in the middle of the decade, we were all Pokemon trainers again. Pokemon Go took the simple concept of catching cute little monsters and united gamers and non-gamers alike in a new way to play. AR. Augmented reality. Not only did it show the power of this new form of game and a new direction for the relatively stale slate of mobile games, it was the first spark of Nintendo's renaissance after the disappointment of the Wii U era, while also serving as the gateway for a whole new group of players to the world of Pokemon. Sure, the gameplay just involved us mashing our screens a bunch and we were forced to sacrifice hundreds of Pidgeys to the Poke Candy Grinder, but for the first time in a long time, gaming felt pure and fun again as we were all once again compelled to catch them all. It's worth noting that Pokemon Go wasn't just popular. It raked in the cash. In fact, the huge influx of mobile and social gaming throughout the 2010s meant lots of money flowing into the games market. So much so that in 2012, video games finally became the highest earning entertainment industry in the world, topping both the revenues of movies and music. Finally, us gaming nerds had won whatever imaginary war we'd been fighting against ourselves. I guess, because I don't think the movies or music industry really cared that much. Anyway, we were king. Dab on you movies, teabag on you music. We had fought to earn the respect that our medium deserved, and we had gotten it. But with that success came some of the industry's worst impulses. Microtransactions, pay-to-win strategies, loot boxes, games engineered for addiction, Kickstarters delivering nothing but empty promises. Heck, they were even expecting us to pay extra for save files. Anti-consumer practices were everywhere throughout the 2010s. 
probably still into the 2020s. And if there was money to be squeezed out of players, 